So, so let me tell you what you're seeing, and let me try to give you some um, context for what you're seeing, some sort of historical uh, context for this piece, and also to tell you a little bit about what we have done with it. Does that make sense? Um, in order to do that, I'm going to go back to the end of the 19th century, okay? So we're going to go back to the end of the 19th century, and we're going to go to where if we look at the hot spot, if we look back over a history map of, of Europe, if we're looking at Europe, European theater, and we say, where is the most definitive work happening right now? Where is the, what is, what is going to be the locus of kind of influence over the next century at this point in the 1890s and early 1900s? It's going to be in a place called Moscow. And in Russia, what is happening at this point is you have Anton Chekhov writing. Anton Chekhov had been inspired a generation before by people like Strindberg in Sweden and Ibsen in Norway. And these, the northern clime is doing an awful lot for the brain at this point, the dramatic brain. And Chekhov is writing, and we have two major figures, because we're going to talk today about, right now, I'm going to talk about content, and I'm going to talk about form. Content is what's written on the page, and form is how we present it. So the content is going on. That's, there's some really interesting content going on in Russia right now, and the most influential playwright uh, that is going to influence the 20th century more than any other is writing in, in Moscow at that time, and that's Anton Chekhov. But also, two of the most influential um, theater makers are also there, and they're also all really close, and in fact... If we take one seminal production, which is the production of The Seagull at the Moscow Art Theater in the 1890s, you have a director named Konstantin Stanislavski, who's going to be one of those major forces. You have in the actor of the renegade writer who is thinking way ahead of his time, you have an actor in his company named Vladislav Meyerhold, who is going to become the great symbolist and has become the second of the great uh, influencers of European theater in the 20th century. And he's playing an actor in that production by Anton Chekhov. So one production written by Chekhov, seminal play written by Chekhov, directed by Stanislavski, and the student of Stanislavski, who's playing the renegade artist in the play, is going to be the renegade artist that is going to come back and challenge everything that Stanislavski is about later in life, is going to become one of the proponents of Soviet theater, is then going to be tortured and executed by Stalin, and this is Russia at the first part of the 20th century. But so you have Meyerhold and Stanislavski as the two that are going to define form in the 20th century. And the form is going to be this. Meyerhold is going to be the one, he's going to be the one who says, forget the old ways. And in a sense, Stanislavski is doing that too. But it's hard for us to see the revolution in Stanislavski because everything that Stanislavski did was so pervasive, particularly in American theater, British theater, and film in toto, that when we see and hear about the work of Stanislavski, we think, yeah, that's theater. Because Stanislavski is the guy that the Americans are going to bastardize and call method. Yes, at least Strasbourg is going to become the American bastardizer of Stanislavski. This whole notion that I imagine myself as, that I, that I think that I am Hamlet in order to play Hamlet, this comes from Stanislavski. This notion of imagining a, uh, 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 an actual life that is put on stage and that everything around me is made to imitate life as we know it so that as an audience I can look in and say, that's me. This is Stanislavski. This is taking realism and naturalism to a a particular point where we're saying the more we can imitate life, imitate life as we see it to be, the more we are accurate in our artistic pursuit. This is Stanislavski. Meyerholt says, yeah, but if I do this when I say something, it tells me something different. And isn't that just as valuable? Or if I talk to you about what's going on in my heart, while I'm doing this, doesn't that tell you something? Does that disturb you in such a way that you think, why are you doing that and tell a difference? So that's Meyerhold. Meyerhold is going to be the symbolist, and Stanislavski is going to be the naturalist. You with me thus far? Then the next generation that comes along, there are going to be a couple of giant 
sponges of this influence. And if we look, and I'm simplifying this, but if we look at it going like this, who's going to be the sponges of Stanislavski? The sponges of Stanislavski, a lot of them are going to be writers and a lot of them are going to be directors, and some of them you will recognize. You may recognize out of Chekhov and Stanislavski, and in particular kind of naturalism, you may recognize names like Eugene O'Neill or Tennessee Williams. You may recognize directors like Elia Kazan. You may uh, recognize actors like Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, all direct line of Stanislavski and Chekhov. On the other side, we have names that become a little um, caviar to the general, names like Artaud and Brecht, names like Beckett, names like Pinter even, that become, they become the renegade side of 20th century theater, if you will. You with me thus far? So, here we have a guy, now we're gonna jump ahead to 1964 Berlin, and a guy named Peter Weiss writes a play the f full title of which is The Persecution and Assassination of Jean-Paul Marat as performed by the uh, inmates of the asylum at Charenton under the direction of Monsieur de Sade, otherwise known in theatrical lingo as Marat Sade. And in, the, and in, in uh, Richard Rooney's household is, oh, that play I love so much, right? <laughs> That incredible Marxist play that I love so much. It's both theater of cruelty and alienation all at the same time. Yes. <laughs> Only Richard Rooney. Got to love it. But let's, let's understand a little bit about what excites Richard Rooney about this piece. Because, because what the descendants of a particular uh, naturalism are doing is they are saying, they are saying our lives, and the way we understand our lives is the way that art should be. And uh, then what the other people are saying, someone like Artaud, so Artaud is a major figure in, in 20th century theater, a major think, he writes a, a, a book called Theater and it's double, and he creates this notion of what we call the theater of cruelty. And the theater of cruelty isn't necessarily being mean, although it may in, in, include that, but it asks us to look at life as the art, as opposed to, to, um, to, to life itself. So in other words, we take away the artifice. What, what Artaud is saying a lot of the time is we take away the artifice or we create artifice that makes us jolt out and not go into that comfortable experience of having that emotional response. At the, you with me? That's theater of cruelty. Is that a fair way of saying this? And, and uh, what he's putting, what Artaud is really interested in doing, is putting the spectator at the center of the work to create a relationship between you and the story that actually implicates you in the play. And this is really big for Artaud, and Artaud is going to have a huge impact, particularly on writers who are going to create the theater of the absurd. People like Ionesco, Samuel Beckett. Without Artaud, there is no waiting for Godot, yeah? So a lot of the writers are going to come out of Artaud, as well as the theater makers. So that's, that's Artaud. Put the spectator in the middle of the piece and make them implicit in the scene, okay? That's one way that we can direct, make a connection to Peter Weiss's Marat Saad. The other great influence is a guy named Brecht, Bertolt Brecht, who's writing in the Weimar Republic in Berlin under a lot of political pressure. Both of them are writing about what Artaud and, uh, and, and Brecht both passionately believe is that the theater is not a place where we go to feel comfortable, to wipe a tear away, to have a laugh, and to go home and say, didn't they have times? But instead, <laughs> But the, stead, the theater is a place where we go, we get provoked, we get jolted, we have something we don't know, we get confused, we get turned on, we, get, we have something violent happen to us, we get repulsed, and we go home and we say, what the fuck? <laughs> this is the response that the great innovators of the 20th century are doing. And it's not just, those of you, and there's a lot of people in this room who know this, this is not just happening in the theater. This is happening with Stravinsky, and this is happening with Picasso, and this is happening, yes, it's happening with Expressionism, it's happening with Cubism, it's happening with, the 20th century is doing this, and the First World War, which makes everyone go, what? The artists are responding to that, and everything blows up. Now, out of this comes all this avant-garde that's going to follow. So Peter Weiss in the 60s is inheriting a whole bunch of interesting stuff. He's inheriting two major artists, both of whom are probably Marxist. Brecht for sure is a Marxist. Um, Brecht's big thing, by the way, is called theater of alienation. And what he is doing constantly is saying to you, um, if I'm up here and I'm doing a scene, darling, I love you. I love you. You've got to imagine there's someone here because it makes it better because otherwise I'm loving a piano. That's odd. 
That's theater of the absurd. <laughs> Darling, I love you. But if I'm talking to someone and say, I love you, I love you, and then I turn and say, you gotta understand how much I love this girl. I, this girl, she, I, really, I really love this girl. In fact, this girl I love, I love her so much. I love this girl, I love her, I do. I love this girl. And then a sign comes out and says, he loves this girl. And then I go back and I do the scene. That's Brecht. It's a really bad version of Brecht. But what it's doing, it's alienating you from the experience of identifying me and, the, and thinking, oh, if only I could be loved like that. Oh, she's so loved so beautifully. And what they're saying is, wake up, folks. You're in the theater. We have a little bit of time with you. We want you to think. Don't get in, don't get, let this become a sop. Don't let this become something that's comfortable. In fact, just as you get comfortable, I'm gonna shake you out and say, hold on a second, we're in the theater. Do you understand that these people love each other and they shouldn't be together? I just want you to understand that. You understand they shouldn't be together because her father's rich and this guy's poor, he can't love her. Think about it, I love you, and they go back. This alienation device is Brecht. So we've got those two things, our toe and Brecht. Our toe saying the spectator's in the middle, Brecht saying don't get comfortable with being in the theater, you're constantly gonna have to think, not feel. And all of them are asking for you to change the way the world is going because all of them are children of the First World War, they're then children of the Weimar Republic, they're children of the Second World War, and by 19, the early 1960s, Peter Weiss, who grows up in Germany as a young man who has lived through in the country that was Germany, we have two horrendous regimes one who came in against Hindenburg with all promises of restoring pride, national unity, and financial security to the people like you and me. Yeah, that's the, the pitch. The pitch is, let's us get our dignity back. March. That happens in Vice's lifetime. Then what else happens in Vice's lifetime in the other part of the country is someone else comes along and says, it's about the people, it's not about the Tsars. It's not about kings. It's not about family rights. It's about the people. Stand behind the people, we stand for the people. And pretty soon 20 million people are starved or killed or put in prisons like Meyerhold by the same person who says, we, we're about the people. And Peter Weiss experiences this in 1964 in his life very strong, as anyone does living in Europe, experiences the hell of both Nazism and the hell of Soviet socialism. And now he writes a play in 1964, learning from Artaud, learning from Brecht, in which he's going to say, what can I do to get people who come to my theater to understand that something is going on that's big? I'm gonna write about a big event that's far enough away from this is Brechtian. It's far enough away from them that they can think and not feel. The French Revolution, the founding of democracy, fantastic. And what he will do in this story, the story of this is the death of one of the great revolutionary heroes, Marat, who's going to die and be replaced, thank God, by Napoleon. <laughs> and we giggle and go, ah, it's all come full circle. We got rid of the German. We got rid of the Nazis, and thank God, in Budapest, for instance, the Nazis are gone, and Stalin is here. And this is the 20th century in this part of the world. This is what, what he is writing about, and what he is asking us to do, and what we have to do in our production. Do I have any time? Yes. What he's doing in our production, what Peter Weiss is saying to us is, are there things in our lives that are worthy of us thinking and not feeling? Are there things in our life that we have to think a little bit differently about? Are there things that if I put them on a stage as a work of art, I'm gonna think a little bit differently than I read it, oh, a bunch of placards down on Wall Street, honey. But if it's in a theater where I'm used to cheering for something, is that gonna change my molecular structure around that notion and think a bit deeper? Am I gonna be implicated in the story well, that's our job, that's Mike's job, and Lorenzo's job, and Anahita's job, and my job, and the job of 21 unbelievably gifted actors, and Monica's job. This is, this is a company ranging in age from 24 years old to 73 years old, who are performing in an environment that I promise you in 10 minutes when you go in, you will have never have seen in this theater, you will have never have seen in a major theater, in the history of theater in Canada, you will have not walked into a theater and seen artists performing in as demeaning an environment as these actors are performing their hearts out for you. 
and they're going, to be, they're going to be sharing a lot of big ideas, and you won't get them all, and you're not supposed to. There's going to be ideas flowing at you. Don't worry about it. Let that do something to you. <laughs> let the image do something to you. Let, the, let, let a phrase do something to you. Let the whole wash over you. And at the end, when you go, I hope you're not completely convinced when the end is, what you're supposed to be doing, whether that was theater, do I call that theater? It looked like theater, but then when that happened, was that the, and hopefully you'll be, if we are our toe dis disciples, and if we are Brecht disciples, and in fact, if we are Peter Weiss disciples, hopefully, with little tweaks we've put in this, hopefully you will feel that this play speaks to you as a Canadian in this time, and I will say, in this time when we as a nation have to make a very important choice during the run of this play that will, not to be too political, let the play do it, that will determine whether the Canada that I grew up believing was my home is the Canada that my grandchildren will be born into. And I believe that that's where we are this is a point where we are in this nation where we have to ask, are our grandchildren going to be born into the same country that we grew up in? And now is one of those moments that we have to make choices. And that's why this play is on right now. And that's why we have made this play speak to you. And that's why we have taken some liberties. Because art is about liberty and art is about revolution and you're in for a crazy artistic revolution. I hope you love it as much as we've loved making it. <laughs>